Assalamu alaikum everyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah, na'hamaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'aghfiru wa na'uzu billah min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyi'ati a'malina. Man yadihillahu falamudillala wa man yudlil falahadiyala. Ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahadahu la sharika la anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. All thanks and praise belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek Allah's help and Allah's forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and the consequences of our evil deeds. And whosoever Allah guides will never be led astray. And whosoever Allah leads astray will never find guidance. And I bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and is his messenger. Qalullahi Ya ayyuhalazina amanutuk allaha haqqa tukatihi wa la tumutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Oh, you have believed, fear Allah as he should be feared, and do not die except as Muslims in submission to him. Qal Allahi, Ya ayyuhalazina amanutuk allaha kulu kawlan sadida, yuslih lakum amalakum, wa yaghfir lakum zunubakum, man yati allaha wa rasulahu faqad faza fawzan azima. Oh, you have believed, fear Allah, and speak words of justice. He will then amend for you your deeds, forgive you your sins, and whosoever obeys Allah and his messenger has certainly attained a great attainment. Amabad. My dear brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, I'm grateful to be here once again to reflect with you on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But before I begin, I want to spend a couple of minutes reflecting and recognizing that we just completed the month of Ramadan, and we just celebrated Eid two days ago on Wednesday. And by witnessing this month of Ramadan in its entirety, we collectively have been given an opportunity to become better versions of ourselves. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts our fast during the month of Ramadan and gives us the strength to continue with the new habits that we have formed during this month and give us new wisdoms so that we may continue to connect ourselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I also want to remind myself first and then all of you listening that we are all attracted to physical beauty in this world. Whether this beauty comes in the form of another person, whether the creatures that we see around us that we find in our natural environment, the foods that grow on trees and that we prepare in our homes and in restaurants, or the things that we create as human beings. We are all capable of seeking and admiring beautiful people and beautiful objects. It is in our nature to want to be surrounded by beauty. Now consider that the objects we create and the natural creations that surround us, all of these things comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can fall madly in love with a person and think of them as the most beautiful creation. How much more beautiful is our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If we can find ourselves in this world to look at the natural environment and say, this is amazing. Imagine how much more beautiful are the heavens that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about in the Quran. And if we are satisfied with our deeds that we just did in this month of Ramadan and every single intention that we made and acted on, Imagine how much more satisfied we will be when we receive the rewards of those deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, If Allah had willed, He would have made you one community. But He will test you with what He has given each of you. So compete with one another in doing good. My dear brothers and sisters, I want us to continue and make the intention to continue to nurture our habits from the month of Ramadan and con continue to become the best versions of ourselves. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us uh, for the hereafter is much better than anything we can experience or imagine in this world, I want us to come back to that feeling. I want us to come back to that, that reminder every day as much as possible. So inshallah, let's come back to the topic of today's khutbah inshallah, which is talking about one of the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And today I want to talk about uh, some reflections on the name Al-Mani. And the root word for Al-Mani is Mim Nun Ayn, which has the meanings of to prevent, to hinder, or to hold back. And if we think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this meaning is conveying to us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best protector for all of creation. Not just the best protector, but the best protector for all of creation. So how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us? Let's consider the sky for a moment. Allah protect us from the devastating power of the sun. And if it were not for the sky and the ozone layer that sits in between, 
we would not be able to live or inhabit this planet at all. In fact, the ultraviolet radiation from the sun would cook us to a crisp almost immediately. It would destroy us and any life that would be able to sustain itself on this planet, on this earth. So we would literally uh, not be here if it wasn't for the sky. Let's also consider the movement of the planets around the sun and the many stars in our universe. The movement of these planets, they follow a prescribed path. And if it was not for this prescribed path by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the stars and the planets would collide with each other with such regularity that perhaps there would be no life on earth. Let's also consider the rain. So the pouring of the rain. And the rains are important for all vegetations, all crops, all creatures that rely on water for sustenance. Nothing would grow without rain on this earth. In fact, the rain is what gets collected in underground aquifers, giving us the ability to draw from those aquifers and sustain ourselves. So the rains pour from the sky for a period. Now, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't allow the rain to stop, then we would all drown in the excess water, the vegetation, the crops would all go along with it, and there would be no life on this earth. Let's also consider the oceans. So rains help fill our oceans. And the ocean contain benefits for us. They contain foods that we harvest and we sustain ourselves with. Uh, so if Allah didn't create the barriers that surround these oceans and keep those oceans in their place, the water from these oceans would overwhelm the land and there would be no life on the land areas. It would just nothing, it'd be nothing but ocean. And let's also consider the intellect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as people. If we didn't have intellect, we would not be able to create tools to help us hunt or even protect ourselves from the animals that, that would potentially encroach our, our habitat. Uh, we wouldn't be able to harvest any crops to sustain ourselves if we didn't have intellect with the ability to build some of these tools. So we wouldn't be able to navigate the oceans to travel across the world if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't give us this intellect. So moreover, or more importantly rather, um, without the intellect, we wouldn't be able to reflect on the verses in the Quran or the other scriptures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us before the Quran. And it is through Allah's scripture, the Quran that is, that Allah continues to give us protection. And how is it that Allah is protecting us with the Quran? One of the ways in which Allah protects us is by setting limits for us. So just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets limits for the rains, limits for the planets, limits for the ocean so that they don't overwhelm the, the land, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us limits within the Quran to tell us this is how you protect yourself from personal harm. This is how you protect yourselves and your communities from harm that would otherwise overwhelm your communities. And two of these limits, inshallah, I want to talk about today are intoxicants and gambling. And these two specifically are called out in the Quran and Sunnah. There are other, other um, limits as well or prohibitions, but these two specifically um, I want to talk about today. So an intoxicant is, is basically any alcoholic beverage that leads to intoxication. So an example of that would be uh, beer or wine. And the alcohol in these, in these beverages accumulates through the process they call fermentation. So in Arabic, the word for intoxicant or wine is khamar. And why does Allah prevent us from consuming intoxicants? Because when we drink intoxicants, we lose control of our emotional, mental, and physical faculties. We become under the influence of these intoxicants. We become susceptible to making dangerous mistakes because our judgment and our awareness becomes jeopardized. So the more we consume of these intoxicants, the less we are aware of our decisions and actions. So in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu the type of wine or intoxicant that was commonly consumed was date wine. And as you can guess by its name, date wine is made by fermenting unripe and ripe dates. So from a cultural perspective, it's not uncommon for wines to be made from locally grown or locally sourced ingredients. And we see this in other cultures as well. So one example of that would be the Japanese culture where they make wine by fermenting rice. Rice is, is a big part of their diet and the rice is what they use to make a drink they call sake. Um, now in the Western cultures, we're familiar with wine that's made from fermenting grapes. So when someone is in a state of intoxication, um, some of the things that happen, their speech slurs. They can't pronounce words correctly. They, they're not acting coherently. The intoxicated person might not be able to put together sentences properly. The reaction time becomes slower. Someone in the state of intoxication may not be able to move as quickly or react 
to a situation fast enough if there's an emergency. Uh, for example, when driving a car, uh, you know, it might be difficult for the car to keep the car in a straight line or even brake if somebody were to just cross without our knowledge. So this creates a very dangerous situation for not just the person themselves, but also for the community that could be impacted by just a terrible decision in that moment in time. So balance is also affected when intoxicated. We can't walk correctly. We can't uh, overcome any challenges easily, which might come our way in that state. And depending on how intoxicated a person could be, they could fall and hurt themselves. You know, vision is affected. Communication is affected. The pathway between the eyes and the brain slows down, which causes double vision or can cause a person to see colors and shades um, that are not even there. So when intoxicated, the ability to make um, any decision is diminished to a point where we would put ourselves in harm if we were in that state. And, you know, not just ourselves, but it would harm anybody else that would be around us in that moment in time. That's why we have all these rules around protecting ourselves despite transgressing uh, past the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, sets for us. So more, moreover, when we, when we are in the habit of consuming intoxicant, it actually creates a physical dependency. It becomes addicting to the human body. And once a person becomes addicted to these intoxicants, breaking these habits becomes a real challenge as well. And, the, and in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala didn't just prohibit alcohol right away. There was a gradual period of time when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala um, declared these prohibitions so that people could gently wean themselves away. Because there were instances where before these prohibitions came around, the Sahaba, or, or there was one instance where the Sahaba was praying uh, or praying Salah and was not able to remember the verses from the Quran that they were reciting at that point in time. Um, so anyways, um, there was a, there's a hadith reported where Umar said, Allah, give us a satisfactory explanation about wine. So the Sahabas were unsure before the prohibition about um, what, how should we treat this intoxicant? How should we treat Khamar? And this is when um, Surah, uh, verse 219, Surah Al-Baqarah was revealed where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells, they ask you a prophet about intoxicants and gambling, say, there's a great evil in both. So maysir is the word in Arabic for uh, gambling. So another authentic hadith, um, Prophet ﷺ said, Every intoxicant is khamar and every intoxicant is forbidden. So there are other verses in the Quran as well where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids us from khamar and forbids us from gambling or maysir. Uh, for example, another place in the Quran where Allah mentioned this is in Surah Al-Ma'idah where we are told Satan's plan is to stir up hostility and hatred between you with intoxicants and gambling and to prevent you from remembering Allah and praying. Will you not then abstain? So Allah is warning us as well that Shaitan, the open enemy to all of us, uses intoxicants and gambling as a way to create division or hatred between people. So how should we think about this verse? So if we think about gambling and intoxicants as tools for shaitan and and shaitan is able to use these tools at will we can start to understand the negative communal effects of intoxicants and gambling uh, that happens we see this uh, all around us where gambling is is legal in america and so so is alcohol we understand and this is not to say the muslim community is immune to this there are uh, instances where the muslim community is also impacted by this so it's important for us to understand that with gambling, just like intoxicant, it is addictive. So how is gambling addictive? When we gamble, there's usually two things that we are doing. One of those things is we're making a decision based on chance. And the second thing we're doing is we're placing a bet, some kind of reward for that decision. And then we're seeking that reward. So as a human, that is something we are wired to have. We want to do some action, and we want some reward for that action. So gambling is gives you both of those components. You're, you're doing something, and then you're expecting the reward for that action as well. So a bet is spending money from the provision that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. So a provision that could be better spent on ourselves or for those that we are responsible for. So when we gamble, 
uh, and let's say we lose that bet, then we're subject to potentially financial hard hardships. We could be you know, losing money that was meant to pay for rent or mortgage. We could be losing money to pay our bills. We could be losing money to purchase food for ourselves or our families. Uh, and this could lead to a situation where we end up borrowing money to cover our expenses that will put us further into debt. And when we have expenses we can't pay, then what happens? We start suffering deep mental anguish and stress. And when we suffer, uh, suffer uh, mental anguish and stress, our focus on our salah goes away. Our focus on our responsibilities go away. And then we're now stuck in this trap of shaitan. And just like intoxicants, you know, the gambling industry knows quite well, the government agencies that license these gambling uh, companies also know quite well that there is a, a dependency that is or an addiction that is created for those who are engaged in this kind of activity. So the social harms that come from that, the governments and the, the industry generally try to create um, guardrails to try and stop the harm from, from you know, getting out of hand. Now, you know, how, how should we think about this? Um, you know, let's let's consider this for a moment. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the limits. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, stay away from intoxicants, stay away from gambling. This is not good for you. And we should live within those limits um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us because going outside of those limits causes harms, not just for us, but also causes harms for our community. So in the case of gambling, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, stay away from it, not good for you. Yet as human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the ability to cross those limits, to transgress against what is good for us. And what do we do after we transgress? We move the line forward. We say, you know what, that's okay. We're going to set new rules. These are the new limits here. And this is how we're going to make sure that these, these things don't harm our communities. Um, but now also remember, from a government agency perspective, there is also a benefit to them that they're considering usually in the way of taxes. So, for our personal interest, it is better that we don't allow these transgressions for ourselves personally. Um, but we also have to recognize that uh, there are, you know, there are rules that allow these kinds of things to happen, and it is our responsibility to also make sure that we build this awareness and build this awareness amongst our young people as well, so that they don't fall trap to these transgressions. Um, but you know, we know that human being is going to fall into some kind of trap. So this is where we remind ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should never lose hope because when we choose to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we repent, just like we did in the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always going to be Al-Ghafoor and Al-Rahim, the all-forgiving and the merciful. So inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate our understanding of the Quran so that, we, so that we may all live our lives under the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah increase us in knowledge and give us the wisdom that gives us the ability to apply this knowledge when we need it most. My dear brothers and sisters, um, I, I hope you found some benefit from this reflection. Um, Almani is... Uh, in some ways similar to another name that we discussed previously, which is Al-Hafiz. Um, and if you uh, remember, the name of Al-Hafiz means uh, the one who preserves. So preserve or to preserve something also means, you know, when something is preserved, it's also protected. But when something is, is protected, it doesn't mean it is preserved. What does that mean? When we, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, that Allah will, um, you know, that the Quran will be preserved by us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that if you, that the, whatever, what the Quran contains, the, the wording, every single word in the Quran is going to carry on until the day of judgment. And if we think about those people who remember the Quran, we call them hafiz. They are the preservers of the Quran. So protector and preserver um, are very similar. And I want to make sure we make that connection as well here today, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves not just knowledge, but also preserves the knowledge that gives us the protection. And these limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these, uh, these uh, guardrails that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to prevent us from engaging in activities, those are things that, you know, if we don't follow them, we will cause harm to ourselves. So, 
the protection itself is not guaranteeing preservation, but the preservation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guaranteeing that, you know, that is protected. So like all of these names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's important for us to take away also is, you know, how can we benefit from the meaning of Al-Mani? So I'll leave you with one reflection, which is, you know, ask the protector, Al-Mani, for protection. The human being, the human state is frail, you know, and, and we should not let the frailty of us being people stop us from returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we went through this exercise in the month of Ramadan where we stopped ourselves from engaging in that which is halal. And outside of the month of Ramadan, we are now no longer um, forbidden from that which is halal. It's, it's all open to us. But we also should remind ourselves that what we... Uh, stopped ourselves from doing it to get better in the month of Ramadan. We should continue that also outside of the month of Ramadan. So continue to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for protection from uh, ourselves when we transgress and go past those limits. You know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to be like angels who are always in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and are never disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah would have made us all angels. And instead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in us the qualities of angels so we are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we set the intention and when we act on that intention. And just like the water flowing into the river, you know, our lives have ebbs and flows. Every single day, every single hour of the day, our emotional state will change. It will go up and go down. Our iman will feel stronger some days. Our, you know, we'll feel more divinely inspired um, certain hours of the day. And then other hours of the day, we just struggle. Uh, to to have that connection, to have that feeling. And that's okay. That's completely okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to return to Allah and ask for his protection from the consequences of our evil deeds. And in Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah teaches us a beautiful dua. Rabbighfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. Rabbighfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. My Lord, forgive and have mercy for you are the best of those who show mercy. So inshallah, Let's remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge us on the day of reckoning, on the day of judgment. But until the day we die, we have a chance to repent and return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on that day, what will we be judged on? It will be our deeds. So the guidance for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, is, is very clear and very simple. We should compete with one another in doing good. Fastabiku, fastabiku khayrat. Compete, race with one another to do good deeds. And athletes know that when they get ready for a competition, there's really only one competitor they need to care about. So if I use this parable of an athlete, there's only one compa compa uh, competitor that, that they need to care about, and that is themselves. They don't need to care about the other competitors. And they know that the other competitors who are really good, who are really excellent uh, in the sport they're competing in, are also competing with nothing other than themselves. So whenever an athlete goes to train every day, their goal is to do incrementally better than their last training day. Not worry about what others are doing, just focus on themselves. And they know that if they put in the work, if they follow the program, they will succeed on the day that they need to perform their best. And when that day arrives, all the athletes are ready. And they know that the result of any competition reflects only the efforts they put on that day and that day alone. So as Muslims, I remind myself first, and then all of you listening, that we should follow the basic program that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already given to us. You know, we, we don't have to go hunt for a program. It's right there in front of us. And what is this basic program that Allah has given us? It's the five pillars of Islam. So they are shahada, fasting, zakat, salah, and hajj. We did three of these during the month of Ramadan. And when we have mastered this basic program, and it takes every single day to put in the work, when we have mastered this basic program, and we look at ourselves and say, okay, I'm ready for that next level of Iman. What is that next level of Iman? And this is where we can go to the Hadith of Jibreel and, and learn that the next level is Ihsan. And what is Ihsan? It is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see him right in front of you. But until that day, you know, we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for constant protection from the consequences of our transgression. And we should remind ourselves that Allah is ever watchful over us. Inshallah, may Allah multiply and accept all our good deeds. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our hearts towards him. Allahumma ameen. 
in the Muslimina wal Muslimat, wal Mu'minina wal Mu'mina, wa Qanitina wal Qanitat, wa Sadiqina wal Sadiqat, wa Sabirina wal Sabirat, wal Khashiina wal Khashiyat, wal Mutasaddikina wal Mutasaddikat, wa Sa'imina wa Sa'imat, wal Hafizina Furujahum wal Hafizat, wa Zakirina Allah Kathira wa Zakirat, Addallah Lahum Makhfirat wa Ajran Kazima. Rabbana Hablana min Zwajina wa Zuriatina, Kurata Ayun wa Ja'alna lil Mutakina Imama. Rabbana Fakfir Lana Zunubana. وكفر أن سيئاتنا وتوافنا مع الأبرار ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا عليك ربنا عليك توكلنا وإليك أنبنا وإليك المسير ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكننا من الخاسرين ربنا آمنا فاغفر لنا وارحمنا وأنت خير الراحمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يأذكم لعلكم تذكرون لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام للمرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين اللهم آمين